Hello everyone and thank you for tuning in. My name is Ben Moulton. I'm a PhD student here at uh, Utah State University. I did this work with Doug Hunsaker. He's my advisor here at USU. Um, so this is a method that we developed looking at, you know, could, could we figure out the inertia of an aircraft um, uh, using some simplified uh, approximations? Could we, could we calculate the inertia of an aircraft? Um, so this paper is something that I presented at the AIAA 2023 uh, SciTech Forum, and I'll have a link in the description of this video uh, uh, linking to that paper. So, so this all started, I was helping uh, Dr. Hunsaker with a flight mechanics class, and as part of that class, they had a big project, they would have to design this glider. Um, and when designing this glider, they would have to, you know, use all these, these flight mechanics principles to design a glider that was stable, um, both statically and dynamically, and they would have to take it to CAD, and they would CAD it up, and they would create this model, and they would have to figure out the mass properties, and they would go back to the aerodynamics and, and the flight mechanics and figure out, you know, the, oh, we, you know, we need to make the vertical stabilizer a little bit bigger, and it was just kind of a hassle. They would have to go back and forth between CAD and change their models over and over again, and so we, what we wanted to do was develop some sort of algebraic equations that would, you know, not be horrible approximations, but uh, that they would be able to use to, to determine the inertia of their aircraft. Um, so, and, and this part may be a little bit of overkill, but, but, but what I wanted to do is make sure we're all on the same page as to what inertia even means. So on the left, we have this big transport aircraft and on the right, we have a smaller aircraft. Um, if you were to grab, you know, use your left hand, grab the tail and use your right hand, grab the nose of each of these aircraft, you would imagine that turning these aircraft, it would be a little bit harder for the one on the left than it would for you to be turning the one on the right. And that's because they each have different values of, a, of inertia about that axis. Inertia is a resistance to rotation, kind of like mass is to movement. Um, it's a similar property. It, it just has to do with, you know, whether it's harder or easier for this object to rotate. So what do we do? Usually, usually when we have aircraft, we'll stick them, and when it's already built, you know, we'll stick it in some, some system and at the risk of sounding susical, um, you know, we'll use these things called bifilar, trifilar pendulums. Uh, compound pendulums, knife edge fulcrums, all these different things. And so, in the, for example, in the top right, we, we have a system that's set up to determine the yawing moment of inertia. So that's the inertia about the yawing axis. Um, so nose left, nose right. And in the bottom left, we have a setup to determine the inertia of the rolling axis of an aircraft. So wing up, wing down. Um, so, but what, what would we even use those for? Well, one thing that we'll use them for is determining the, the, the uh, stability and control derivatives of an aircraft from flight test data. We'll also use it for determining control surface sizing when we're designing our aircraft. And it's also used in initially, initial um, air elasticity analyses. So that's what we do for a full size aircraft. But what would we do for some design? You know, we're in the middle of design process. We haven't quite finished building it or we're still working on, you know, getting out some kinks or something. Usually we'd use a CAD model, we'd use some numerical method that would add up all these mass properties, um, and 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 we would use that. However, it can be incredibly complex to, to CAD up an aircraft like that. What, what we wanted to see was, is there some, you know, once again, is there some algebraic equation that we can use when you're just barely starting the aircraft design process? So first I wanted to start off with, with some analytic equations. So, so when we talk about volume, we're, we're doing a triple integral over some finite volume of some object, right? Um, and then these equations that I just put up there, those are for the moments, and, and I'll talk about those in a little bit, what we use those for. So something you'll notice is we pull density outside the integrals. That's because we're, we're approximating the density as constant. Now that may seem like a constraining assumption, uh, excuse me, a, a constraining approximation, uh, but we'll, we'll get into a little bit of detail about, about how that affects the, the math here. So the, these are the equations for determining the, the moments of inertia on the left and the products of inertia on the right. And then um, once again, we're assuming a constant density, so mass is density multiplied by volume, and then we'll use these moments divided by the mass to calculate the center of gravity of, of whatever this object is. And lastly, we're using a positive tensor definition. So that means that the off-axis components have a negative sign in front, and that's just convention for, for, for what we do with aircraft. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here. We have some component properties. We listed them in the paper, but we didn't derive them just because they're everywhere else. We just wanted to have them all in one place. So we have a cube, a hollow cylinder, a hollow sphere, 
um, and these are the equations for the volume and the inertia, you'll notice that we don't have equations for the center of gravity, and that's because the center of gravity is zero for each of these ob objects. In other words, the origin is located at the center of gravity. And, and we'll talk about uh, uh, what that, what we, why we care about that a little bit later on. So the first thing, uh, the first component that we more or less, uh, you know, made up ourselves is this wing segment. Um, so you'll notice it's a symmetric airfoil. We have a semi-span. I'm going to use my mouse here. Um, we have a semi-span. That's the length measured across the, along the y-axis. Um, so uh, now that I mentioned it, let's talk about the coordinate frame. So we have the coordinate frame located at the root quarter chord right here. So this is a, a right wing. Um, the X goes out the nose, Z goes out the bottom, and Y goes out the right wing. And so then we also have this quarter chord line, this straight quarter chord line that goes from the quarter chord at the root over here to the quarter chord at the tip. And we have a straight quarter chord um, sweep angle. And then we have a root chord and a root, uh, excuse me, a tip chord. And then we have a root thickness and a tip thickness. You'll no notice that this is a maximum tip, or excuse me, maximum root uh, uh, max thickness percentage multiplied by the local cord. Um, and once again, we have this symmetric airfoil shape. Now, this method works for any symmetric airfoil shape. We used uh, uh, NACA four-digit series for the majority of the analyses that, that we'll talk about here. But uh, you could use any, any, uh, uh, any symmetric airfoil shape. And we go into detail in the, in the paper a little bit about how you would how you would impl implement that for your whatever your object is. So, um, just wanted to list the approximations that we're using here. The first is that we're assuming or we're approximating it as having constant density. The second is we have no camber in this wing. Then I'll move my mouse off of there. The third is that we have no twist in this wing, and the fourth is, fourth is that we have a straight quarter cord. And, and once again, we'll we'll get into. Our, in our case studies, we'll look at how those each of those approximations affect our results. So, so something important to note is because we're using symmetric airfoil and how we've defined those analyt analytic equations up above, we actually wouldn't be able to solve those without doing a change of variables. So here's the change of variables that we're using. Um, we're putting it in terms of this change of variables to make the integration possible. And once again, for more information, you can see the paper. This is how we would calculate the volume. You'll notice a kappa parameter and an upsilon parameter. The kappa parameter is a geometry uh, coefficient, and the upsilon has to do with the, uh, it's a coefficient that has to do with the airfoil thickness distribution. Um, and once again, for more information, you can check out the paper to see their definitions as well as their derivations. Here we have the definition of the aircraft, or excuse me, the wing segment CG location. Um, so you'll notice, as we said before, with the other components, their, their CG was located at the origin. But the way we've defined the wing segment, the CG is no longer located at the origin. And so we have to define a CG location based on, uh, as determined from the origin of this, of this wing segment frame. Here we have the components of the inertia tensor. So we've got our moments of inertia and our products of inertia. And here's how we define our, our inertia tensor. So you'll notice we'll have to use some form of th this form of generalized parallel axis theorem to translate it to be about the aircraft, or excuse me, the wing segment CG location. The second uh, component that we'll have to talk into a little bit more detail is the rotor. Um, so, so when we talk about propellers, what we want to know is the, the time averaged, um, in quotation marks, the time averaged inertial properties of this of this propeller on the aircraft you know propellers are usually small but they do have a little bit of inertia and so we wanted to look at what well looking over time if we averaged out the inertia at, at each of moment of time you know um, how would we how would we calculate that inertia property so what we ended up using was was basically an object if you've ever seen like the movie inception or something like that the little top that he uses if you can imagine a disc that you kind of pinch out like that um, that's 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 more or less the geometry that we're talking about here. Um, looking at basically the 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 inertia of this disk that's used to approximate a propeller. So here we have a hub height, and you, once again I'm using my mouse to kind of direct your attention. We have the origin located at the CG location, so we won't have to worry about CG location on this guy. So we've got X pointing out the nose, Z pointing down, and Y pointing out the right wing. Once again, similar to the wing segment uh, coordinate frame. So we've got a hub diameter, a rotor diameter, a root thickness, or excuse me, a root cord, a tip cord, 
and a root thickness and a tip thickness. Once again, where, where the tau is a max percentage, um, a max thickness in percent cord. Okay, so, so we can have a similar process. We're able to calculate the volume of this guy. So we'll have a, a hub volume plus a, a rotor volume. And then we'll have some inertia components. And you'll notice these gamma and these capital T parameters. Those are also rotor geometry parameters. For more information, you can check out the paper. And this is how we calculate the inertia of this, of this rotor. So we have the hub parameters on the left and then the rotor parameters on the right. And you'll notice that the products of inertia are zero for this guy. Now something additional here is we're gonna have a ang an angular momentum vector. Um, once again, that's because it's a propeller and it's rotating with time. And so it's gonna, gonna change the angular momentum, the total angular momentum of this aircraft. And so this is how we've defined that. So now that we've talked about all these components, let's, let's talk about the full aircraft. Um, so you can see what we've got there. X once again points out the nose, Y out the right wing, Z points down. So summing up the, to get the total of the aircraft, uh, total mass of the aircraft, we just sum up the mass of individual components. To get the CG location of the aircraft um, from whatever the origin is of our, of our, of our coordinate frame, um, we're going to sum up the individual CG locations rotated into their pr respective frames. So we could have dihedral on a wing segment. Um, we could have, you know, a, a, a cylinder could be used, a hollow cylinder could be used to approximate the fuselage, but let's say it's at some angle or, or you know, a similar thing we could say about a turbine or something like that. Um, but we'll, we'll rotate all of these um, respective um, CG locations and then we'll multiply it by the mass, divide by the total mass, we'll be able to get our total CG location. Similar process for our inertia, we're going to rotate each individual inertia, use generalized parallel axis theorem to shift that guy to the aircraft, uh, the aircraft uh, uh, CG location, and then we'll sum those all up. And the last thing, we'll, we'll sum up the individual rotated angular momentum vectors, and that'll give us a total angular momentum of the aircraft. So let's get into a couple of the case studies, looking at the effects of these approximations. So here... We've got the, um, wh what we did, so, so th this case study is on the common research model, the CRM. So this is an aircraft uh, developed, by, developed by NASA um, that is publicly available. You can use it for studies in aerodynamics and, and uh, they use it for a lot in air elasticity. Um, but we just took an OML of the geometry that was originally presented by Taylor et al. And so what we did was we took an OML and we made a CAD model of that. And then we took that same CAD model and got rid of the camber. And we took the uncambered CAD model and got rid of the twist. And then we took the one that had no twist and forced all of the quarter cord sections to be straight. So we ended up having, you know, these four different CAD models. So the OML, the uncambered, the no twist, and the straight quarter cord. And then we compared them in percent error, or excuse me, percent difference with, um, with the OML considered as truth, as well as our present method. So you can see there that, that our, our equations, our algebraic equations, have a percent difference from the OML mass properties. For example, right here we have the XCG location of about 1%. And a similar thing happens with the IZZ, so that's the yawing moment of inertia. Um, we have about a half a percent error um, when comparing our, our um, algebraic equation method to, to the OML uh, CAD properties. And then um, this is the IXZ parameter. So this is the, the IXZ product of inertia. It had about a 10% error. Now that may, that, that it's a little bit misleading. Um, that 10% error is, um, if we were to redimensionalize that percent error, um, we would notice that the difference between the IXZ of the OML and the IXZ of our pre present method actually isn't that enormous. Um, what happens is IZZ is actually orders of magnitude larger than IXZ, and so we actually have less difference. It just seems larger because IXZ is smaller. Um, and so, so this kind of gives you an idea as to, as to how, how our method stacks up against these CAD models where we're using these approximations. Um, and, and once again, this isn't all the information. For more information, you can see the paper. So we did a similar thing with um, a propeller that's similar to that used by the Spitfire Mark, Mark uh, I believe it's Mark 7, um, and you can see a picture of it on the, on the left. 
and it had about a 2% error in the yawing moment of inertia. So you'll notice we didn't put up the, um, the CG location or the IXZ that we had earlier. Um, we could put up other moments of inertia, but just for brevity, I, I only wanted to do this one. And the other guys were zero, the, the CG location and the products of inertia, as we talked about earlier with the equations. Um, so you can see about a 2% difference using our method versus the actual um, CAD geometry. And then the last thing I wanted to talk about is a case study we did on an actual uh, 3D printed aircraft that we built, uh, designed, built, and flew inside our lab. Um, so this is Horizon. It's a 3D printed aircraft. And so what we did was we had the access to the actual uh, CAD model. And similar to the CRM, you know, we did one that was just the OML, and then we did one that had no camber, and then we did one that had straight quarter cord sections, and we looked at the, the buildup of um, difference in, in this percent difference across these methods. Once again, for more information, I direct you to the paper. We're just going to talk about the ones that we're showing here. So we had a 10% difference comparing our present method to the actual CAD geometry, excuse me, in the XCG location. We had a 20% difference um, in the yawing moment of inertia and about a 14% difference in the, in the uh, IXZ product of inertia. Um, so just a note about this and, and as well as the CRM, um, what we did was we took the mass of the actual model and spread it out on the other models, right? Because we're assuming constant density on these other guys. Um, but once again, for more information, you can check out the paper. So summing things up, what are the benefits of the, this method? Well, the first thing is it's really simple. We just have an algebraic solution that you can plug and play wherever you want. It's also incredibly accurate. It's 100% accurate for wings of constant density with the other approximations that we've talked about. And we also recommend this method as a great initial esti estimate in the aircraft design process. Um, so, so we talked about that, you know, the 20% error in the, in the IZZ moment of inertia, or excuse me, the 20% difference in the IZZ moment of inertia of the Horizon aircraft. You know, that's not like an end-all be-all parameter, but we give that, just to give you guys an idea, if I'm, say for some reason I wanted to figure out the aircraft of some aircraft that I have sitting in the hangar, if I know the geometric properties and I know, you know, say the vertical stabilizer weighs yay much, I would be able to figure out the inertial properties and I could expect to be pretty close. You know, we, we don't give the 20% error and say you're going to be within this. We're just saying, you know, it's you'll be this about this close. It's just to give you an idea. So some further application, and, and this is something that we could have done with this horizon method. We So the horizon geometry inside, it, it's incredibly complex geometry. It's got lots of vacancies, lots of complex uh, squiggles inside of the design. You can check out the CAD models, actually, on Thingiverse. Um, and it's actually, uh, again, an, once again, an incredibly complex geometry. We could have, instead of just assuming this constant density uh, cross-section, we could have created a wing, uh, you know, these wing segments of constant density, and then stuck a smaller wing segment inside of that with a negative density to kind of create this shell object, if that makes sense. And we could have done that, and we could have gotten much closer. But what we wanted to do once again here was kind of give an idea as to you know what 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 kind of difference can we expect, um, just as a, as a first guess. And and once again, that's that's what we recommend that for the aircraft design process. And and uh, let's see. So some further work uh, could look at adding camber to these equations, adding twists to these equations. Um, so we wouldn't need to use those approximations in this method. Within the next month or so, this uh, method will be implemented in Mockup 4. That's an online GUI uh, web-based aerodynamics uh, tool developed in-house by our lab. It, you can find it at aerolab.usu.edu. There's a picture of an aircraft in this in this um, in this web environment. Uh, and so, once again, that'll be within about a month that we'll have that up there, and you'll be able to calculate the inertia of your aircraft. Thank you for listening, and I will answer any questions or comments that you have in, 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 the link, in this video. Thank you.